Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Lori DeToro, editor of OEM Off-Highway Magazine. Today's webinar is Right Sizing Your Engine, Navigating the Complexities of Engine Optimization, which is sponsored by Caterpillar. If you are looking to enhance your business performance by right sizing your engine, you're in the right place and you're not alone. Many OEMs are exploring the benefits of right sizing their engines to meet changing business needs, reduce costs, and enhance productivity. However, making informed decisions about engine right sizing requires a deep understanding of the technology and a thorough analysis of your business requirements and constraints. That's why Caterpillar created a comprehensive guide to help you navigate the complex landscape of engine right sizing. And we're gonna to get to the presentation in just a minute, but before that, I wanna go over a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand after today on the OEM Off-Highway website. The displays during the webinar are fully customizable for you. You can make the video player larger or you can make the slides larger to view them easier. It's your system, so please feel free to set it up however you like. You should also check out the related content section. Our friends from Caterpillar have some information there for you, and they also have a survey that we'd like you to answer before you exit the webinar. So don't close out until you um, answer the survey for us. We'll also have a Q&A after the end of the main presentation. So get your questions in whenever you think of them using the Q&A section of the webinar and we'll answer them as time permits. Also remember this is a live event so when we mess up and we will forgive us and laugh along with us. So now I'm going to get started with introducing our amazing presenters who are with us today. We have Bill Hardy, who is the Technical Engineering Manager, Alan Chen, Product Marketing Manager, and Brett Roberts, Telematics Strategy Manager, all for the Caterpillar Industrial Power Systems Division. Thank you so much, thought leaders and attendees, for being with us for this webinar. Now let's get started with our first question. So whoever wants to answer, what are the key factors that determine the right sized engine for a business? So hi everyone, this is Alan. I can feel this first question. Uh, when you ask about a right sized engine, uh, the concept is interesting. There's obviously no one size fits all solution, especially when we, we talk in the off highway world. But I think the very core of picking the right sized engine would depend on a, a few characteristics. I think maybe listed on the next slide, Lori, if you don't mind. I thought I moved to that. There we go. Yep. So a couple of different characteristics we would want to look for. First and foremost, how much power do you need? And along with that, how much torque do you need? When we start venturing off into transient response, with weight and size, the hot, cold, and ambient capabilities, the altitude capabilities, uh, how much your engine or the machine that you're putting the engine in tilts, what kind of workload they do, and then what kind of fluids they consume, like fuel or DEF or oil or none of the above. Um, and then the alternative capabilities, which, for example, include spark ignited or gas, uh, gaseous fuels. But the point is that there are lots of facets involved in picking an engine. And maybe the first way to start would be to understand the power and torque density of the engine. Um, and what I mean by that is if you take the amount of power or the amount of torque an engine can make, and you simply divide that by the displacement, let's say it's 12, 13, 14, whatever the displacement is, you get a power density number or a torque density number. Of course, the higher the density would signify that it's been sized to produce more power in a smaller package, in a displacement package. So if you can imagine, if you had the choice between making lots of power, like a thousand horsepower with, let's say, a, a giant building sized engine, or if you wanted one that was a microchip sized engine, of course, most people would gravitate towards the microchip sized engine. I don't know if uh, Bill or Brett, you guys wanted to add anything else? Yeah, thanks, Alan. You know, I'll, I'll jump in here. And I think we all recognize that we're in the business to make a profit. And so this idea of a right-sized engine for your business in a, in a business that uses an engine is really important. 
one of the key factors is probably cost. Now, the immediate thing that we think about when we think about cost is the price of the engine. How much am I going to have to pay for that engine? But, you know, even maybe more important than that are some of the ongoing costs, what we like to refer to in Caterpillar as total cost of ownership. And I break that down into three different categories. You know, first off is kind of your daily operations. Second is the ongoing maintenance that you have to do. And then third off is maybe the, the, the costs associated with, with uh, having that particular engine in your business. So let's talk about the daily costs. You know, picking an engine that maximizes the efficiency, minimizes fuel consumption, minimizes depth consumption. That engine is going to be able to make you more money because it does the same amount of work with less inputs. And, and so that's a really important consideration as you're thinking about the right sized engine for your business. The next one is kind of those ongoing maintenance things. You think about your fluids, you think about filters, you think about like mechanical maintenance that you have to do to the engine. Obviously, the more often you have to change your filters, the more often you have to change your fluids, the more often you have to do something to that engine to maintain it, that's, that's gonna drive up your cost of owning that engine. And then the, the third one that I think about, which is one that we don't always spend a lot of time thinking about, but you know, if you can find an engine that's able to do cover a broader range of applications, that can be really attractive. If you think about it, one engine that covers a lot of applications means that you have fewer engines that you have to carry in inventory, means that you have uh, fewer parts that you have to carry. It means that you maybe have to do less training with some of your people that are in service those engines. The logistics, all of those types of things can really factor into that, that total cost of ownership over time. Yeah, and um, I'm glad you mentioned the total cost of ownership bill, you know, because the right size engine for the application doesn't just stop at the product, right? It's it's like you said, logistics, infrastructure, ease of serviceability, and support support network are, are all important. Um, but what if something went wrong with your asset and you needed a part, but you can't find it? You know, the best product in the world could be rendered useless if you can't um, get parts and, and fix issues quickly. In off-highway applications, um, time not working could be tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars down the drain. And we take that fact very, very seriously. Um, so, you know, we connect our engines with telematics so that we can fix issues quickly and efficiently and proactively detect smaller issues before they become, you know, big catastrophic type failures. Uh, this is the, you know, kind of support and feedback the optimized product needs. And you can think of it as kind of the, the right level of support for the right size engine. Well, it definitely sounds like um, a, a lot of information is needed and it can be very complicated. So what data do you need from a customer to help them select an engine and its size? Sure, um, I can answer that, Lori. <clears throat> so we, we talked about the engine's performance characteristics before, some things that need to be considered, but then what does that translate to in terms of inputs from a customer, someone you're working with? So uh, some examples, okay, you have it on the slide here, are asset functionality, work cycles basically, how is it? How is it going to be run? Uh, what kinds of work cycles do you think it'll it'll go through? The function and work cycle frequency would be something like how often does it do that action? It could be a boom lifting up, it could be a boom going down, it could be a bed lifting up and down. You know, what is that action? How often do you do it? And then perhaps if you're thinking about like uh, Brett and Bill mentioned the uh, total cost of ownership, you think about how often or how many hours do you use it a year? And then perhaps even, you know, how many years do you expect to be using this? Uh, another good one is obviously geography. You know, <clears throat> is, your, is your asset going to be running in a high mountain somewhere? Is it going to be cold in the Antarctic or something like that? Uh, and then perhaps chassis size limitations. You know, are you trying to put the right sized engine in an existing chassis? Are you trying to cram that into an existing chassis or are you designing something new around it? Because maybe there's more liberty with uh, when you have something new. Um, and then maybe the last one I was thinking about is how large the entire fleet could be. 
uh, when you think about just an engine versus uh, looking at an entire system or a fleet of engines, that might change your perspective on what you're willing to tackle. Yeah, and, and just to add on here to what Alan said, you know, we we really also want to understand how much an asset is running and, and what type of environment the asset is running in, um, you know, to, to prevent unplanned downtime through efficient preventative maintenance scheduling. Uh, so, you know, for example, if an asset is in a remote location in a harsh environment, it needs to be connected and remotely monitored to ensure it's running um, efficiently and, and getting serviced proactively. So this will, you know, really ensure that the right size engine is running at its best uh, for the customer really as long as it possibly can. <clears throat> That's awesome. Thank you for that. So our next question is what are the environmental and functional problems that may occur if an engine is oversized? That's a good question, Lori. I think I'll jump in on that one. Um, you know, oversizing an engine, a lot of times you think about, well, bigger must be better, right? You know, I mean, must be, it'll last longer, it'll produce more power. I mean, that's just not the reality of a modern engine anymore. Um, you know, when you think about it, if your engine's too big, one of the first things that happens is likely it's going to be too heavy. And in many of our applications, you know, customers are getting paid to move things. They're, they're getting paid for the amount of material that they can haul. So, you know, for every pound that your engine is too heavy, that's one pound less that you're going to be able to haul. And that can really add up over time. The other thing that happens is if the engine's too big, you know, it's going to take up more volume. It's going to require more structure. So, again, that's taking away capacity from that machine. That's making that machine less efficient. Um, you know, switching gears, though, as we think about, you know, why don't I want just a big engine from more of an engineering perspective? You know, having an engine that isn't running at its optimal load is inefficient. And so you're going to burn more fuel. You're going to waste more energy with that inefficiency. Um, engines typically run better at higher loads. And, and you may ask, well, why is that? You know, engines typically run better at higher loads because, the baseline friction, the baseline parasitics of that engine are a lower proportion of the overall power output. So less of your total power output goes to offsetting that, that, that friction and, and those parasitics. And so running that engine more optimally means that more of the fuel is going into doing the work and less of the fuel is, is going into those baseline parasitics and friction. Likewise, heat transfer. On a larger engine, you're going to get more heat transfer because there's just more area to transfer that heat to. So, again, using the right sized engine, running at an optimal load, a higher load factor, that's going to give you the most efficiency overall. And that, that results in a lower, lower fuel burn, which results in you know, less fuel concern, uh, consumed, which results in making more money as, as you're hauling that material around and, and using that engine in an optimal way. Fantastic. Doesn't sound like a good idea to oversize, to be sure. So right what size. are the benefits? Yeah. What are the benefits of an appropriately sized engine? Uh, yeah, I can answer that, I guess, in, in reflection of what Bill just mentioned. If you think about a right size engine, therefore, you would improve efficiencies, improve fuel efficiencies more so. And uh, the equipment would operate more efficiently in general, consuming less fuel. And especially if you're in a higher regulated country, you would consume less DEF or diesel exhaust fluid. Um, and if you think about operating costs, because the engines are therefore compared to their machines, they require less maintenance and repair over the life of the equipment. So that directly, like Bill mentioned, translates to, to preventing downtime and the uh, costs associated with that, uh, even even the opportunity costs, which would mean like the foregone uh, productivity and the work and the payload that you could have gone had the engine continued to, to run smoothly. Um, and I guess lastly, having uh, the right sized engine would improve performance. You, you, know, you provide the right amount of torque, you provide the right amount of power that you need and you minimize or optimize the, uh, the wear tear on the equipment.
Awesome. Thank you. So when you're trying to right size, what are the trade-offs between engine size, performance, and costs? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can start off on this one and maybe maybe Bill or, or Brett want to jump in later. But um, I'm thinking the trade-offs, right? The first thing you want is you want the performance of your engine and you want to get the job done with the smallest engine for as little cost as, as possible, right? And that doesn't necessarily always mean just power output. Performance wouldn't necessarily mean power output. We could also talk about things like, <clears throat> does the engine or your assets have the capabilities of running pumps off of it? Does it have the capabilities of running accessories? Because chances are your application has a lot of other moving parts that require the engine to power, you know, like hydraulic pumps, for example, in hydraulic applications. So sometimes an engine's size, let's say the, the width or the height, might get compromised a little bit just to make room for that pump drive so that you can actually drive the pump that they need. And that's the actual performance that the customer needs. I don't know, Bill, if you have some, something to add to that. Yeah, no, that's, those are great points, Alan. You know, maybe just to elaborate a little bit on how we look at things at Caterpillar. Uh, Alan, Alan <laughs> talked about it, but it's really important to us that with the engine solutions that we offer at Caterpillar, we're, we're able to accommodate a lot of different applications. Um, you know, the majority of the OEMs that we work with are looking for custom solutions. Um, you know, when you go to our factory, we have some really impressive factories at Caterpillar, but we kind of refer to them as high volume job shops because we're making a lot of different customized solutions that, that work for each of the customers that's looking for a Caterpillar engine. Um, and part of doing that is making sure that we've got good differentiation, we've got good reconfigurability, that our designs are versatile. Uh, we use something we call modularity a lot. You know, basically think of it as like Lego pieces you put together in different configurations to work the best for our customers. Um, so, you know, Alan talked a little bit about driving pumps. But uh, on our new C13D engine, for instance, when we were designing this accessory drive and we were considering the modularity, how we we're going to stack together the Lego pieces, we designed the adapters that our customers are going to mount their pumps to to be clockable, to allow them to be able to position them in different positions, still come off of the same takeoff, which gives us the commonality that helps with cost and those types of things and minimize the design complexity, but then allow the customers to have configurability that really allows them to you know, to satisfy their requirements for their specific application. We did some other things like, you know, flywheel housings that accommodate different setups for pumps. If you don't need a great big pump, you don't, you don't necessarily want to have to pay for that big pump drive. But if you do want that big pump, hey, you're willing to pay for that <coughs> pump drive. So we have different housings, different uh, flexibility there for customers, depending upon what their requirements are. And then we've got this, uh, this great thing that we call the fluid module on the, on the C13. Uh, C13D engine, which is a, uh, we've got it for both the coolant and the oil, as well as for the fuel. And those have both on engine mounted options as well as remote mount options. And the nice thing about those remote mount options is as you package that engine into your application, you can put those filters wherever you need to put them for serviceability. Or, you know, if it works well for you and you can, you can handle it, you can have the on engine application, which makes the packaging really easy and the, the assembly probably easier on the, on the customer side of things. So, you know, some, some really cool things that I think we've done to, to try and maximize flexibility for customers while still getting the benefits of a high quality, you know, high production environment like we have at Caterpillar. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to go back um, to, to this question as well. Um, you know, the, the trade-offs, right, between engine size and maybe talk about uh, a common conception of this idea of displacement, you know, uh, bigger displacements is is perhaps better. No replacement for displacements is, is what we would internally say sometimes. Now, <clears throat> I think the point of a larger engine or engine displacement is first and foremost that transient response, right? The transient response, I'll break it down into snap torque and speed at a certain load, how fast you can get the speed uh, at the load at a certain speed. So how fast can you move transient response? What's your transient response? The snap torque part of it, you just can't get away from physics, right? 
how much torque can you get <clears throat> at 0 0.000001 seconds, like the infinitesimally small seconds, how many, how much torque can you get? That is a direct equation of, of physics of how much volume of air is in your chamber, which means if you have a bigger chamber, like if you have a bigger engine displacement, therefore you have more air, which means you can get more torque, more snap torque with a larger engine displacement. However, does the immediate snap torque always get what you need in terms of a full work cycle? Uh, let's say you wanted to lift up some dirt. Does the fact that you have a little more torque at the 0 0.0001 seconds really matter as much? Or is it really the full motion, the full range of actions? So then you consider, how about at 0 0.1 seconds? How about 0 0.5 seconds? How much torque do you get? Well, that then depends on how fast can we squeeze that air into the chamber, right? And the velocity of air would depend on the turbo. So you could squeeze a lot of air in there really quickly to get you the same level, maybe even more, transient response in a small engine as opposed to a larger engine. So, you know, you're thinking of the right sizing of your engine, sometimes larger is better, sometimes smaller is better. It's about picking the right size. Yeah, and Alan, maybe I'll just add one more thought to that as well. Um, sure. You know, we talked a little bit about how the efficiency of an engine can really help when you're thinking about right sizing an engine. Uh, going back to our C13D engine that, that, uh, that we've talked a little bit about in this video, we spent a lot of time reducing the friction of that engine, reducing the parasitics on that engine, making sure that we have the optimal amount of flow for, you know, lubrication, for cooling, and making sure that we can minimize the amount of work that it takes to pump air through the engine. All of those efficiency building blocks also help with this transient response. So actually a smaller engine that's more efficient can have better transient response than a really than a larger engine that's a lot less efficient. So, you know, some of that benefit also comes into play here and and negates that, you know, no display replacement for displacement thing that you were talking about, Alan. Yep. No good point, Bill. Fantastic. That was a great conversation. And, you know, we cannot get away from physics because physics doesn't change, does it? <laughs> so our next question, what are the latest trends and innovations in engine technology and how could they affect an engine right sizing strategy? Yeah, thanks, Lori. I'll, I'll take that one. <clears throat> um, so, you know, engine right sizing strategy, we we already see that data and analytics significantly um, affect the optimization of the work cycle. So, you know, it might be great to have the best product with the most optimized performance, but it's also pretty essential to understand how that asset is behaving and running. For instance, a customer expected the engine to perform at a certain level all the time, but suddenly they don't see the same level of productivity. Um, you know, having that asset connected with telematics would, would tell you if there may be something wrong with the engine and that optimized work is being uh, sacrificed until there is, you know, repair or replacement. Um, you know, furthermore, if, if, if you're talking about a fleet, and this is where it gets pretty interesting, really, um, you can hook up all your connected assets and lay out and enhance how each purchase will perform in unison with the other assets in the fleet. So, you know, <clears throat> what, what, what good really is an excavator that can dig dirt if there aren't enough dump trucks to, to carry the payload, right? You know, all those, all those things can be optimized together when you have connectivity. You know, we're, we're seeing this trend more and more as customers focus on optimization, which goes beyond just having the right product. Awesome, thank you. So next up is how can OEMs and machine owners or operators evaluate the impact of engine right sizing on their business operations and ROI? Yeah, I can, I can answer that, Lori, or at least start. I'm thinking if an OEM has the mindset of how much more can a machine do as a result of picking the right sized engine 
or therefore translating to how many more units will someone buy or rent knowing that this machine can now do more you know take for example a dr a drill OEM, someone that has a, a drill, we can take how much or how quickly they can drill to equal productivity. Because uh, how much they drill equals their payload. Um, now, if an engine was right-sized, meaning it's as power dense as possible, they can push out as much work as possible. They could hypothetically increase their drilling productivity. And if you increase the drilling productivity, that's the value proposition that your end users or the people that are buying those drills really care about, right? If they know that this machine has higher drilling productivity than another machine that uses, let's say, in, in uncorrect or not correct sized engine, um, then they would obviously want to buy the one that is more rightly sized, with the, the right sized power source or engine. Yeah, that's great input on the OEM side, Alan, you know, and, and I think it becomes even a little bit simpler when you think about it from an owner operator and all of us can probably, you know, relate to that pretty well. When it comes to owner operator, it's really about that total cost of ownership that we touched on earlier. Um, you know, the upfront price of that engine is going to be important, but then how much do you pay to do the work and to maintain that engine over time? And some of those costs, you know, that, that come into play when you're thinking about total cost of ownership from the owner operator perspective are, that original investment cost, the validation and engineering costs, um, the, the fuel costs, the maintenance costs, the parts costs, the inventory costs, and the remanufacturing and salvage costs, all of those play into how much it's going to cost you to maintain that engine and to own that engine over time and hopefully be able to maximize the work and, and therefore the profit that you can get out of that engine over time. So, you know, reducing those costs by having an engine that's more friendly from a components, maintenance, assembly and service perspective is really going to be good for your business. Yep. Fantastic. And if a owner operator is happy with the OEM's machine, they'll buy more machines. So that's also another benefit. <laughs> that's right. That's so um, can you tell us, because we were excited about getting to see uh, the engine during Con Expo, can you tell us about the engine you launched during Con Expo? and how it will help OEMs and end users select the right size for their operations. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it's a, it's an honor and a privilege to introduce the the new 13D that we've been working on for quite a while. I know Bill mentioned some of the uh, the good value propositions already that this this engine has. The C13D is a brand new Centerline 13 engine that we launched at Con Expo this year of 2023. And it can do the power of today's 13 liter, 15 liter, and single turbo 18 liter. Uh, the, the high end horsepower is 690. That's 515 kilowatts. Uh, and the low end is 340 kilowatts or 456 horsepower. So when we think about right sizing the operations, you know, we'll, we'll look at this internally as an example. Of course, but this applies uh, externally as well. But some of our customers that are taking a current 15, C15, or a, a single turbo C18, now they can use a 13 liter sized engine. In fact, this 13 liter engine, the C13D, makes even more power and more torque than the single turbo 18. So you get more performance and it's a smaller package. Therefore, they will see improvements in fuel efficiency. They'll They'll also see improvements in things like altitude, ambience. It's smaller, it's lighter. Uh, this engine was designed to be emissions compliant for today's regulations, like your US EPA tier four final, EU stage five, China non-road four. You know, There's a global engine, so it's designed for meeting emissions across the board there. But it also serves as uh, Caterpillar's foundational platform to launch into future emissions and fuels. So I know there's a lot of talk about energy transition, alternative fuels, spark ignited gas fuels. This will be that engine that'll be the building block for, for those kinds of fuels. Um, I don't know if uh, Bill or Brett have anything you want to add. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, a little bit about what we showed from a telematics perspective. Um, so yeah, I mean, we had a we had a great time at Con Expo. It was a really good show for us, and uh, it was great to see everybody there. Um, 
you know, every every engine on on the Caterpillar stand at Con Expo <clears throat> also uh, featured a telematics unit that we can offer uh, with our engines. And one of these telematics units that we um, showcased was the Product Link Elite. Uh, you'll also see it referred to as the PLE device. Um, <clears throat> this this unit really enables a, a plethora of things. Um, one of which is remote troubleshooting. So Basically, with remote troubleshoot, um, you can do live remote diagnostic sessions, and um, you have the ability to pull remote product status reports, uh, which give in-depth details on the engine's health um, for, for great troubleshooting capability um, without having to actually go physically to the engine. Um, <clears throat> the PLE also enables remote flashing. <laughs> which allows us to flash engine software from, from anywhere, uh, which is hugely beneficial if we ever need to update software on an engine for any reason. Um, and, you know, the device is really quite capable and, and can collect both CAT engine and OEM machine data points into our robust or, um, or into our monitoring uh, user interface. Um, and it, it allows OEMs, dealers, and the, their, their customers uh, to access um, the data to, to enhance the performance of their cat power machines. So it was, uh, it was really exciting to be able to show these products that we had at Con Expo and really, really great time um, talking to our OEMs and our, our end users. I think, Brett, even in fact, I think next to the C13D engine, there was the PLE683 that was was shown right there next to it. So, yeah, it was great. Um, in fact, I think we have on the next slide a, a little video that we wanted to show the highlights of the, the C13D to, to everyone that's that's watching here. So if you can play the video. Leading power density, limitless versatility, endless applications. All of this in the all new CAT engine. Introducing power, efficiency, and productivity like never before. It starts with power, next level power density to be exact. With even more torque and payload capabilities, this engine is packed to perform on any job site in nearly every industry. Then there's efficiency, because the engine installations don't get much easier or more efficient than this. This compact engine comes in a highly integrated complete package designed for easy installation and optimization of chassis space. And that means you'll get more done quicker. With the durability, longer service intervals, and hands-on cat dealer support, this new engine is built to give you a lifetime of proven power. Want more? You're looking at it. This, this is the all-new CAT C13D engine. If you want to learn more, all you have to do is call your local CAT dealer. That was very exciting. So um, the next question we have for you is specifically about the C13D. What are the main benefits of the C13D and why did Calip Caterpillar decide to produce it? Well, thanks for asking that question, Lori. Uh, you know, Alan and I have been able to work on the C13D since before it was the C13D. We uh, we worked on the initial strategy that, uh, that came up with the need for this engine platform and uh, have been able to work on the design uh, of this engine, you know, up to the point that we're at today. We're, we're really proud of that. We've got several years under our belts. We've got tens of thousands of hours on engines. Um, we're getting, ex we're really excited to be able to share this with our customers. And that's probably, you know, the, the number one thing to talk about, about the benefits, you know, and why Caterpillar decided to do this. Um, as 
as Alan talked about, you know, some of the key benefits, as we saw in the video, some of the key benefits, you know, higher power, better power density, more torque capability uh, than the existing engines that it's going to replace, uh, better altitude capability, uh, broader ambient capabilities, all of this at, you know, those higher power levels. Uh, fuel consumption is going to be better. Our noise is going to be better. It's a lighter weight engine. Uh, it's going to package a lot better than, than some of our existing engines. Um, you know, it's, it's emissions capable across all of the, all of the off-road emissions categories. Um, it, it's highly reconfigurable. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking about, you know, today, but it's total cost of ownership is designed with the customer in mind. And at the end of the day, that's the reason Caterpillar is doing this. We're doing this engine and making a significant investment in this engine because of our customers. We spent a lot of time as we were trying to figure out what the right thing to invest in from an engine perspective was talking to our customers. They love Caterpillar engines, you know, and, and so we talked to them about what they love about their Caterpillar engines. We also talked to them about, you know, what do they think that we could do better uh, with today's Caterpillar engines. And so we tried to combine both of those into this new C13D engine to come up with an engine that keeps those best attributes of the older engines. You know, they're known for their durability. They're known for, uh, for their power and their, and their performance. Um, and combine that with, with, uh, with the next generation of technologies, you know, better efficiency, um, you know, more capable of, of the latest generations of emissions, prepared for future emissions, power density, compactness, all those types of things are going to come into play here. So, you know, really the, the answer to that question, why did Caterpillar do it, is because we continue to be focused on our customers. We want to partner with our customers. We want to work with our partner, with our, with our customers. And we're really looking forward to getting this out in the dirt and uh, to, to moving some material around with this engine and, and seeing how it performs. We're, we're pretty proud of it. Yeah, and I, I guess I want to also add that if you're if you're looking for more information on the technical side, the the specs, for example, or if you're looking for brochures, uh, you can always visit the, the website cat.com and then navigate over to the industrial section, and you'll see that uh, front and center on that page. Uh, otherwise, if if you want to memorize the the exact address, it's www.cat.com/c13d. Pretty easy. Cat.com slash C13D if you want more information. But like Bill said, very exciting times to introduce this engine that we've all been working really hard on for, for quite a while now. That is very exciting. <clears throat> it was very exciting to get to see it at Con Expo too. So the that was our last um, slide of the main presentation. Here's where you can find more information, but Alan's already told you about that. So um, you can find more information here and get your questions in. We have time to, um, to answer questions. So don't forget to do that. And we've got a couple that are already in. So let's get started with that. Uh, the first one is when, when is it coming out? When will it be available? Uh, yeah, I can, I can answer that, Lori. So the pilot engines, which are the predecessor to, to production, or basically the first few production engines, we're calling pilot, those will be available quarter one of 2025. And then if you're looking for a production, full production engine, it would be quarter two of 2026. So between now and then, I know, you know, we're just, uh, two, two years early, but sometimes it takes a little while to configure a new engine, even even if it's smaller, uh, configure a new engine into the chassis, or perhaps gives ample opportunity for an OEM to design a new chassis. We've had some OEMs talk about that, seeing the possibilities of this power density and torque density, and saying, "Hey, I, I bet I can make a a new, more product uh, productive machine because of this engine." So, 2025 Q1 is is the pilots. Q2 2026 is the production. That's awesome. Thanks. So why a new diesel engine? Maybe Lori, I'll, I'll chip in on that one to start with. Um, we get that question a lot. You know, you can imagine even inside a Caterpillar, we're getting that question. Why are we spending so much money to develop a brand new diesel engine? And that's because, you know, at Caterpillar, we believe that diesel engines are part of our energy transition. 
making those engines consistently more efficient is part of the energy transition. Um, using them in applications that's li that are literally going to build the infrastructure necessary for the energy transition. That you know you're, you're going to need that capability, and we want to make sure that our customers have the most efficient, most capable engine possible as as part of that transition. And so, you know, we think that there's a bright future still for the diesel engine. We'll continue to make it more efficient. We'll continue to look at uh, you know more carbon neutral fuels and so forth for the engine. We've got a lot of plans in stock. Um, and, and all of it really comes down to making sure that regardless of the application, you know, because Caterpillar is also investing heavily in other energy forms, you know, whether it's batteries and electrification or alternative fuels, those types of things. But regardless of what a customer needs, we want to make sure that we have the best product possible for that customer. So another question, a lot of fluid power manufacturers are moving from running off a diesel engine to electric powered hydraulics. Would the engine size and optimizing the engine help with adding the, um, or, or helping an OEM move toward the electric hydraulics versus the traditional hydraulics? Sure, we've had a number of OEMs that have already begun doing this. So we're very familiar with this kind of territory um, for example, some of our customers couple our engine up to a generator or an alternator to run electricity. Um, so the engine size still matters there because if you're looking at a, let's say a hybrid package, is what we're calling that, uh, the overall package is still going to be dependent on your, your motored part, your electric part, as well as your engine part. If you can make that engine smaller, perhaps even smaller than you would have originally made it because now you've coupled it with uh, an electric portion of it. Your overall package gets smaller yet. It's still more optimized. So if you're wondering if engine size matters to hybrid application. Yes, it does. In fact, it's a, it's a better building block because now instead of using just a large engine to do your, your work, you can perhaps couple a smaller engine with your electric pack uh, to do the same amount of work. So this is a, a quick, simple question. Where can I get one? Yeah, <laughs> that one's, uh, it is simple. Um, so contact your local cat dealer. Uh, all of our cat dealers are, are ready and willing to discuss this, this new engine. Like I said, the production is going to be in 2026. Pilots are in 2025. So if you're chomping at the bit to start collaboration and put this engine in your chassis, now is the time to discuss. Let's reach uh, reach out to your local cat dealer, certified cat dealer, and then they'll connect you guys with us. Sometimes even myself personally, Bill personally, Brett personally, and uh, we'll work on collaborating and integrating the engine into your chassis. So another question um, has come in, how much time did it take for you to develop this new engine? Oh, that's a fun question. So, you know, I mentioned that Alan and I have actually been working on this engine since we first started. Uh, it's been several years now. Um, you know, what, I, what I'll tell you is we have gone through multiple phases of this engine prior to even being ready to give it to our customers. Uh, we started out with a mule phase of the engine, which was based on one of our historic platforms and tested out some of the two, new technology, allowed us to validate some of the simulation work that we'd done. Uh, you know, we did a lot of virtual design on this engine, as you'd expect. And so by building up that mule engine, we were able to test out a lot of that, uh, try out some of the new technologies, make sure we had the right recipe. And then we've, uh, we've done a, a couple design phases since then, um, really looking at the first design phase being our validation of simulation. So building up a, an engine that was designed virtually, putting it in iron, making sure that those predictions that we made matched and then, um, you know, we're doing a limited prototype phase here now as well uh, for our internal purposes and for select customers, uh, actually putting these engines out in the dirt, getting them ready to go out and actually work in the real world environments. Uh, and again, further validate the simulation that we've performed to make sure that, you know, all corners of the box are going to be covered. And that when you get this Caterpillar engine in your pilot phase, that it's going to work the, uh, the way that you expect it to work in the application that you have, regardless of where you put it, like you'd expect from a Caterpillar engine. 
Awesome. We have one more question that just came in. You can send in more if you would like to, guys. Um, the next question is, is it possible that the design elements that improve the power density of the C13D could influence the design of future smaller engines, perhaps the C7 or the C9? Yeah, I can answer that question. So I think at the crux of this question is, how were we able to achieve such great power density from this 13 liter, right? And the simple high level answer would normally be, well, you get more air and you get more fuel in there. You got higher power, right? Simple chemistry and physics. Uh, but I guess the thing that you run into is durability. So you sacrifice some of that durability for the increased power density, unless you optimize for that durability while you're designing for this power density. So what I mean by that is, this is, like I said, a, a brand new centerline engine, new cylinder block, new head, all of the water jackets in there were optimized down to the, the thickness of the casting of the iron for the head. They were all optimized, meticulously optimized. And like Bill mentioned, simulated for hours and hours, days and, and years in order to get that fine tuning, you know, new bolting pattern, new water jackets, new valve bridges and sizes. All of that is what makes the engine more durable while trying to push in more air and fuel to to give you that power. So if that's the crux, then the question is, does this design then influence our smaller engines? And of course the answer is yes, it's going to, because like this engine, when this was uh, born, we've taken a lot of the, the lessons learned from years of experience in designing engines, you know, the 9.3, the 9.3B, the C13, the C13B, the C15, you know, we've taken a lot, the 3406, if you go back far enough, we've taken a lot of lessons learned there. And we use that to shape the foundation of our new engine. So therefore, what we've learned here in the C13D, we will in fact also use it in our learning for the smaller engines. I'll maybe just add to that too, Alan. Um, you know, that's a great description. And we get that question a lot too. You know, why is a smaller engine going to be as durable or more durable than the engines it replaces? And like Alan said, you know, at Caterpillar, we have been designing and putting diesel engines into off-road machinery for as long as anybody. We're one of the oldest manufacturers of that type of equipment. And because of that, we have a really good understanding of the material limitations, the mechanical limitations, the design limitations that it takes for an engine to live in this environment. And so as you think about downsizing an engine, when you design an engine specifically to be downsized, when you design an engine specifically to achieve a certain power density, that durability is built into that design. And so that's an easier way of saying what Alan just said, but that's what gives us a lot of confidence that this C13D engine, which is gonna replace some of the larger engines in our lineup, is going to do so in a way that does not compromise durability. That's fantastic. Thank you. Is there something else, Alan? No, I was going to say well put, Bill. That's right. Oh, awesome. Um, another question. I heard that it has no EGR. Is that correct? And tell us about how you eliminated the EGR. That's a great question, too. And I love talking about this one. You know, it all starts with the customer. And when we were talking about this platform and laying this platform out for our customers, one of the things we heard was, boy, we sure like simple engines, you know, and uh, we sure like things that, that, uh, that, that, aren't, uh, that aren't overly complicated, that, uh, you know, all these systems that have failure modes with them, you know, can you design this new engine to be as simple as possible? And that's what we set out to do. Now, getting down to the technical aspects of how did we do that, First off, you know, and we've talked about it already, but when you design a more efficient engine, more of that energy gets to go into power. And so, you know, less of that, less of that energy indirectly kind of results in emissions. But because we've got more energy going into power, we're wasting less of that energy. The engine's more efficient. That helps out from a temperature perspective. That can help out with some of the emissions. But the other key part of this whole thing is the advanced after treatment system that this engine's going to have on it. Our advanced after treatment system is gonna be compact. That was another thing that we heard from our customers. If it has to have after treatment, make sure that it's compact. So it's gonna be compact. It's also gonna be the most efficient after treatment system that we've produced. 
So we're using some of the latest generations of technologies. We've collaborated closely with suppliers. We have a lot of intellectual property tied up in after treatment within Caterpillar and a lot of knowledge how to after treatment systems and have some of the most efficient package dense uh, after treatment in the industry. And so we're really happy that we're continuing that legacy uh, on this particular product and coming out with the next generation of after treatment, which uh, will be, you know, again, more compact, more efficient. And because of that high level of efficiency that we're achieving with, uh, achieving with this particular after treatment, coupled with the efficiency of our engine, the advanced control systems that this engine has, we're able to eliminate that EGR system off of this engine and still maintain exceptional efficiency. Awesome. Um, another question came in. What is the continuous rating for the C13D? Uh, sure, I can feel that one. So it'll be laid out in more detail on the tech specs. Like I mentioned earlier, you can go on the website to, to find them. Um, but we have eight ratings that span from 340 to 515 kilowatts. So it'd be 340, uh, 360, 380, 400, 430, 460, 500, and 515. Eight, eight ratings there. Uh, the question is continuous rating. Continuous rating would be classed, I guess, as the A or the B tiers, up to perhaps a C tier, depending on on continuous, because I know that continuous is is uh, is not necessarily a, a huge industry-wide term. In fact, for example, Caterpillar uses the tier system, and they don't say in continuous or intermittent. So I would liken the continuous up to a C tier, which is 500 kilowatts, would be the maximum. All right. Well, thank you for answering our final question that came in. This has been a wonderful presentation. We appreciate all the attendees for joining us and Bill, Allen, and Brett. Thank you for the, the time and the great um, content. Attendees, remember to check out the related content from Caterpillar. Also, remember to please answer the survey before you exit. Thanks again, everyone, and we hope to see you all again for our next webinar.